Oh, bonsoir, and welcome once again to This Be The Verse Poetry For Adults here down in the sub-sub-sub basement of PS75, the Emily Dickinson School, and happy Valentine's Day. Now, Valentine's Day is supposed to be all about love, but not many people really know how it came to be. So I thought I'd give you a short history of Valentine's Day. It used to be that in pre-Roman pagan times, from February 13th to February 15th, there was a spring fertility ritual called Lupercalia, in which men of the village would sacrifice two goats and a dog and then strip the flesh off of them and from the flayed flesh of the sacrificed animals they would fashion whips and then they would run around drunk and naked through the village and women would purposely put themselves in the way of these men so that they could be whipped with the flayed flesh whips that the men had fashioned and this was supposed to be a way of cleansing the women and making them more fertile. The nights would be filled with raucous lovemaking, and then kaboom, nine months later, a bunch of babies would be born, just like magic. So about a thousand years or more go by, enter the Catholic Church in the fifth century. The Catholic Church looked around and said, oh, no, 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 no. Pagan fertility ritual for three days? I think not. So Pope Galatius decided that instead of a three-day fertility ritual that was a pagan feast, he would make it one day, February 14th, and it would become a Christian holiday named after the famous Saint Valentine, who, by the way, no one had ever actually heard of, and of whom there are absolutely no references in any myths or any historical records at all. So, you know, the Catholic Church never lets silly things like little facts get in the way with that. So, Pope Gluteus Maximus, or Pope Epididymus, or whatever his name is, or was, decided that he should make a story up about Valentine. But before I go any further, I, for those of you who are not familiar with the Catholic Church, the popes are sort of the drag queens of the church, because I'm just saying. But perhaps that's a little reductive and disrespectful. What I should have said is that the popes are the most powerful and the richest drag queens in the church. In any case, Pope Coitus Interruptus VI decided that he needed a really good story to go along with St. Valentine's Day to make the tradition really stick. So he told the people that Valentine was actually a martyr from two centuries prior when Claudius I was the Roman emperor. And Claudius I was supposed to have persecuted Valentine because Valentine was marrying Christian couples at a time when it was illegal to be Christian. Well, once Claudius got wind of this, he nabbed Valentine, threw him into prison, and decided that he needed to be made an example of. So, Claudius ordered that Valentine be beaten to death with clubs. But you know, that Valentine, he just would not die. So Claudius decided that he'd order that Valentine be stoned to death. But you know, those pesky martyrs and saints, saints still Valentine would not die. So Claudius ordered that Valentine be beheaded, and that worked marvelously well. And that about brings us up to today, 
with the $20 billion plus industry of Valentine's Day, where the rich get richer and the poor get fatter and fatter just by eating chocolates. Now, let's talk about love, real love, the kind that enters your life like a miracle and doesn't cost a penny. Today I have two love poems for you. The first is from Ezra Pound, and it's supposed to be a translation, and ordinarily I wouldn't do a translation because I wanted to dedicate this class to poems written in English. But it's supposed to be a translation from a Chinese poet from the 8th century named Li Po. And the story is that a Japanese scholar related this poem to an American scholar who then related it to Ezra Pound. But the Japanese scholar's knowledge of Chinese is a bit sketchy, and neither the American scholar nor Ezra Pound ever spoke or read Chinese. So I think it's fair to say that this is a poem written in English by Ezra Pound after the 8th century Chinese poet Li Po. The poem is called The River Merchant's Wife, A Letter. And the only other thing that you need to know is a little bit of geography. It is, of course, a letter from a wife to a husband who's away at work along the river. And at the beginning of the poem, you hear that they live in the village of Chou Kan. And at the end of the poem, you hear of another city, Chou Fu Sa. And what you need to know is that for an 8th century young girl to get from Chou Kan to Chou Fu Sa, she would need to walk 100 miles north because it's upriver. So from Chou Kan, 100 miles on foot, to Chou Fu Sa. Now, The River Merchant's Wife, a letter. While my hair was still cut straight across my forehead, I played about the front gate, pulling flowers. You came by on bamboo stilts, playing horse. You walked about my seat, playing with blue plums. And we went on living in the village of Choken, two small people without dislike or suspicion. At fourteen, I married, my lord, you. I never laughed, being bashful. Lowering my head, I looked at the wall. Called to a thousand times, I never looked back. At 15, I stopped scowling. I desired my dust to be mingled with yours forever and forever and forever. Why should I climb the lookout? At 16, you departed. You went into far Kutoyen by the river of the swirling eddies, and you have been gone five months. The monkeys make sourful noise overhead. You dragged your feet when you went out. By the gate now, the moss is grown. The different mosses, too deep to clear them away. The leaves fall early this autumn, in wind. The paired butterflies are already yellow with August over the grass in the west garden. They hurt me. I grow older. If you are coming down through the narrows of the river Kiang, please let me know beforehand, and I will come out to meet you as far as Cho Fu Sa. Isn't that sweet? I love that. The next poem is a sonnet from William Shakespeare, because you didn't really think you would get out of here alive without a Shakespearean sonnet, did you? No, I thought not. So this is sonnet 130. I particularly like this sonnet, because Shakespeare lovingly gives the fig to the courtly tradition of exemplifying the love object in all kinds of celestial imagery or unrealistic imagery. The 
face like the sun, eyes like the stars, hands like lilies, skin like the snow. And you'll find these types of images in poems by Edmund Spencer and Sir Philip Sidney and even the earlier poet, the Italian poet, Petrarch, when he talks about his Laura. But Shakespeare gets real. He brings it down to earth. He knows that even the most attractive among us still burp and fart. So he makes his love object earthly and beautiful still. Sonnet 130. My mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Okay, this assignment, if you choose to accept it, is for all the independent booksellers out there. If you own an independent bookstore, or you work at an independent bookstore, or even if you just go to an independent bookstore, find a love poem inside the bookstore and give me a video response with you reading it. Tell me who you are, where you're from, the name of the bookstore, and give us a love poem. Until next time, Remember, the world is full of wonder. Pay attention. I am Too Tight Latrec, and this be the verse.